Put your questions in that uh, white box for today's tutorial and also for the tutorials of tomorrow and the day after. So if you have any questions about any of the lectures, just submit your questions in that white box. Submit your ballots. Okay, I'm very, very happy to be here um, and give this uh, set of four lectures on applications of topology in uh, quantum field theory. So it will be quite, uh, quite a few topics to cover. Uh, covering many exciting recent developments in the high energy physics community and in the condensed matter physics community. So I'll try to give you uh, some general concepts which have uh, emerged from those uh, developments and give you some simple examples where these uh, new results have uh, striking applications for uh, old questions about young mills theory and also for new questions that uh, arose in the in the process. So in the first lecture, uh, the first lecture will mostly be about uh, setting up some uh, machinery, uh, setting up some language. So in the first lecture, we'll now discuss the concept of symmetries. We'll discuss the general notion of symmetries, including generalized uh, symmetries. So this will, our discussion will be also about uh, generalized symmetries. Then we'll discuss the general notion of a, a quantum anomalies. And uh, finally, uh, for this discussion to have some beef, I'll show you a striking example, a really striking example in quantum mechanics, in quantum mechanics, uh, just quantum mechanics, where you have a, an interacting extremely non-trivial system and using ideas from topology, you can say something very concrete about it. And some home exercises will be to per perhaps try to verify uh, through perturbation theory, instanton calculus, the standard methods of quantum mechanics that this prediction holds true. So this example in quantum mechanics will be both uh, for pedagogical reasons. So in high energy physics, this, we will say that this example is the simplest example of an anomaly. This is the simplest uh, possible anomaly. And in condensed matter language, uh, this is uh, this will be uh, referred to as perhaps the simplest SPT phase. Uh, but I'll use the high energy physics nomenclature uh, throughout. And also, if you have any questions about whatever, even if it's just tangentially related, uh, please stop me. Otherwise, it will be quite dull. Okay, so I'll start. Uh, this is the co this is going to be the context of lecture one, and in lecture two we'll proceed to more complicated examples and to deeper questions about more complicated systems, not just in quantum mechanics. What is SPT? Yeah, so in high energy physics, this what condensed matter people call SPT is what we call in high energy physics anomalies. Uh, SPT stands for symmetry protected topological phase. So in high energy physics, we just call it the Toft anomaly. Uh, it's the same thing. Okay. So, uh, I'll start with the notion of symmetries. Trying to define symmetries in general. And then we'll discuss the... Okay. So, first, I'll, I'll start for simplicity from continuous symmetries, which are the most familiar uh, constructions from textbooks. So, the most familiar construction... Uh, from textbooks will be what we will refer to as a zero-form symmetry. A zero-form symmetry is essentially a conserved current, J mu, satisfying D mu, J mu equals zero. That's the most familiar uh, sort of symmetry. And when I'm, when I'm going to discuss symmetries, I'm not going to discuss uh, space-time symmetries. Uh, we will discuss space-time symmetries a little bit later, but for now, these are going to be all in only internal symmetries. Then, there is a notion of two form, one-form symmetries. And that's going to be, in the continuous case, associated to a current with two indices, such that it's anti-symmetric in these two indices. So it's anti-symmetric in these two indices. And uh, it's conserved uh, in the same fashion as before. 
And so on, this continues. So we can also have two form symmetries, which will be associated to a current with three indices, which is conserved. Okay? And th this, could be, uh, this could be continuous symmetries. In a did we're talking about some d-dimensional quantum field theory, and it could possess uh, such symmetries, in fact. Well, we'll see some examples soon. So, uh, so higher quantum field theories could possess such symmetries. Now, a convenient way to write these equations, these conservation equations, is using differential, for differential forms. We can write it like this. So a p-form symmetry uh, satisfies, in general, this equation. So that's, what's a p that's a general definition for a p-form symmetry. A p-form symmetry uh, is associated to a p plus 1 uh, current, which satisfies the divergence-free, the, the, con the, continuum e the conservation equation the continuity equation. So that's the general definition for a continuous p-form for a continuous p-form symmetry. So once you have such a symmetry, once you have such a current, you can construct a charge. What is a charge? A charge uh, is going to be an integral over this, of this current, J, over some surface. Now the surface is going to be uh, the surface is going to be, in general, d minus p minus one dimensional. And we're going to integrate over the surface star j. And uh, for a p-form symmetry, star j is a d minus p minus one form. And therefore, this, is ma this makes sense. So this is a definition of a p, uh, of a charge that's associated to a symmetry. And uh, the thing that acts on the Hilbert space is the exponential of the charge, as usual. So the exponential of the charge is the thing that acts on the Hilbert space. Or you can also think about it in the pass integral language. Now, this I'm going to denote by u of sigma. And I'm going to talk about this u of sigma now. Sigma is the surface uh, whose uh, su subscript I I've suppressed. And u is this operator. It's an operator that depends on a surface. So this is an operator that depends on the surface, on a certain surface. OK? So every time we have a symmetry, we have some operators that depend on surfaces. And they may act on the Hilbert space, and they may act on various objects in the theory, which we'll discuss now. Yeah, I I you can think about it either in a Lorentzian signature, in which case you might take the surface to be space-like, or you can think about it in Euclidean signature, and then the surface is an arbitrary surface that's embedded in a d-dimensional space. For now, I'm not going to uh, specify uh, which case I'm talking about. Now, the key, the key property and this is the key obs observation which allows to d generalize our discussion also for discrete symmetries, is that if you think about it as an abstract operator that depends on the surf on a surface, on a certain surface, it has the following property. Suppose you deform the surface, sigma, suppose this is sigma, and suppose you deform the surface like a little bit. You make a small deformation of the surface. The key property of this operator is that it's independent of small deformations. As long as you haven't crossed anything, there could be, if, if you've crossed something, as we'll soon discuss, it will depend on whether you've crossed something or not. But if there is nothing, no operator insertions in between here, then uh, this is independent of the surface. So this is in the key property of this, uh, of this abstract operators is that they're independent independent of sigma for small deformations, where by small we mean small enough that we don't cross anything, which are small enough. So any quantum filters in general could have many such operators. And uh, some operators are trivial, so we wouldn't even consider them to be genuine such operators. For instance, if it's independent of sigma, we don't consider that to be an interesting operator. 
So such operators are called topological surface operators. And they have to be distinguished from trivial surface operators, which don't depend on anything. Topological surface operators means that they are independent of the surface for small enough deformations, but for big deformations, you could get something non-trivial. So these are, these are called topological surface operators. And topological surface operators is the most abstract and general way to think about symmetries in quantum field theory. And this notion generalizes also for discrete symmetries. So if you have a topological surface operator, you could discuss continuous and discrete symmetries uh, in, the, in, the, in the same realm, because these are some examples of topological surface operators. Now let me make some comments about general properties of these topological surface operators. So first of all, they allow us to generalize the notion of symmetries to discrete symmetries. So this, the, this notion of topological surface operators, which are functions of some surface of dimension d minus p minus 1, this notion is general. So it works for both continuous and discrete. Now let's see what these operators may act on. What do we mean by insertions that these operators may intersect? So zero form symmetries, which are associated to surfaces of dimension d minus 1, namely co-dimension 1, Zero form uh, symmetries are associated to some operators, U of sigma, which act, topological operators, which act on local operators. So they act on local operators, O, which are, uh, which are at some point x. So the idea is that if you have a local operator O, it's supported at some point x. So Sasha was talking about such local operators, such as this TT bar operator. So if it's a local operator, you can surround it by a d minus dimensional surface. And uh, by the action of the symmetry, what we mean is uh, what happens if this operator is inside versus outside. Since this operator is topological, you can always deform it, shrink it, and eventually you get something which is a new local operator, perhaps up to a phase or up to some group transformation. So when we do this operation, we get a new local operator up to perhaps some group action, G. So we see that, zero, that the group action arises from this construction naturally. If we have some local operator and we take a d-minus dimensional su surface associated to a zero form symmetry and surround this operator by this topological surface, we'll get a new local operator, which we can think about as G times OX. Now, <coughs> this G, is an element of some group. Because if we take two such local operators, so this U will be associated to some G. For every G, for every group element, there is some topological surface U. And we can take several of those. We can take two of those. This would be associated to G. This will be associated to G prime. And then we will get, if we take UG prime, UG, O, we get G prime times G times O. So we get a natural group action by surrounding these operators with topological surface operators. This, this operator acts by surrounding the... Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Is it linear? Uh, well, uh, uh, you have a local operator, and you surround it by a topological surface. Since this surface is topological, you can shrink it, as long as you don't hit <coughs> this operator in the middle. So at some point, you get an object, which is a local operator, which is surrounded by something really tiny. And this can be, by general principles, expanded in local operators. By general principles, this is just the sum over local operators. But this sum of local operators may not coincide with the original local operator, <coughs> but we think about it as given by a group action on the space of local operators. Now, one subtlety here is that it's not guaranteed. Just from the axioms of topological surface operators, it does not follow that they are labeled by group elements. In particular, it does not follow that there is an inverse. So this is an assumption. You could imagine that the, in the complete, complete generality, axiomatic, axiomatic setting of quantum field theory, the topological surface operators are not necessarily labeled by group <coughs> elements, and they may not obey the axioms of group theory. But I'm assuming that that's the case. So this is, this is more like an assumption rather than a derivation. Another important comment is that you may get a non-abelian group out of it. 
there could be non-abelian symmetries in quantum filters, including discrete non-abelian symmetries. Yeah? Say again, I, you have to ask. See the, the group element G is an element of the fundamental group depending on the dimension of sigma? What is the fundamental group and what is the dimension of sigma? And where is, what is G? I don't understand that. What is the you have some class of topological surface operators. Yes. Uh, suppose you are, I'm giving you a topological surface operator. And you surround the local operator with this topological surface operator. Then by general axioms of quantum filter, you get an expansion in local operators. Now, there is an assumption here that I'm making which is that for all the topological surface operators, this expansion can be viewed as an action of a group element on the space of local operators. So I'm ma making an assumption that the space of local operators is in a reducible representation of some big group G, and these topological surface operators are implementing the action of the group elements on that space. This is an assumption that I cannot prove. I think the question was, is, is it linear operator? And, uh, and then it's linear Linearity the follows from locality. Operator. Linearity follows from locality. This is the assumption. This is what I wrote here. But it's not guaranteed that this space of actions on local operators corresponds to the action of an actual symmetry G, of which the local operators furnish a reducible representation. This, uh, I mean, it, it looks like it's true if you have a symmetry. Uh, yes, one direction power, is obvious. But, but, but yeah. The other is yeah, any symmetry, which is a group, could be continuous or discrete, has some, gener has some elements. Uh, and for each such element, there is a corresponding topological surface operator. That's what I explained. One direction is obvious. It's essentially a fancy way of stating Nutter's theorem. But the other direction is, uh, is not proven, and it may not be right. But I'm just going to ignore that issue. It's not going to be important for what I say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll give you many examples. I'm just trying to set up an axiomatic framework that will <coughs> apply equally to all the examples that we're going to discuss. In fact, most of the lecture course will be about concrete examples. I'm just trying to state uh, some general facts first. Yeah. Uh, what's the difference between, why do different surfaces respond to different operators? Because you just explained that you can shrink everything to a point. Right. So why do different surfaces But you see, uh, it's an interesting, the question is why do different surfaces correspond to different surfaces? You see, in a given quantum field theory, there could be many distinct topological surface operators. So once you shrink them, they implement a slightly different action on the space of local operators. Nobody guarantees that there is a unique such operator. In fact, even in the continuous symmetries case, we can construct many such topological surface operators by taking in exponentials of integrals of currents with various coefficients alpha. This would correspond to an action, let's say this is a U1 symmetry. This would correspond to rotating the Hilbert space by U1 at angle alpha, or the space of local operators. So for any alpha, for these distinct alphas, these are distinct topological surface operators. So this is an example where the group is U1, and the space of topological surface operators will be labeled by some alpha. So this is the stupidest example, but yeah. Uh, so the question is if it means that there are infinitely many charges. Uh, no, the usual terminology is that uh, topolo each topological surface operator is one charge. That's how we think about it, okay? We don't say that the fact that there are topological surface... So the fact that there are topological surface operators doesn't mean that there are infinitely many symmetries in the theory. Rather, it's the opposite. We think about the topological surface operators as the generators of the symmetries. But you're right that in principle we could also study this, the sector of topological surface operators as a, like, a small subset of the full theory. And in that sector there will be a huge symmetry since these operators will be topological. But in the full theory there is only a finite number of, uh, well, there is only a finite number of generators typically of symmetry. So any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, the same idea. The state operator correspondence is about a situation where you can shrink some cycle and you get an expansion in local operators. So this is the same. It's using basic, this is basically the axiom of locality, that anything that can be brought to be as small as you like 
uh, must be expandable in local operators. You demand that J is the omission. G? J. Ah, yeah. Then you will have the, this, uh, this inverse. Exactly. So one thing that's not guaranteed is that the topological surface operator has an inverse topological surface operator. It doesn't. Nobody guarantees that. But if it comes from a U1 symmetry, then indeed, there ma there exists an inverse. However, it does follow from the axiom that this product is associative. So we do have some properties in general without making those assumptions. But it doesn't follow that there is an inverse. Okay. Now for one form symmetries. So zero form symmetries are about local operators that you can surround by a co-dimension one surface. One form symmetries are associated to currents with two indices and are associated to co-dimension two surfaces. Now co-dimension two surfaces can surround not points, right? Co-dimension two surfaces cannot surround points. Think about two plus one dimensions where it's easy to visualize. In two plus one dimensions, a co-dimension two thing is a line. A line cannot surround the point. There is no topologically meaningful way to do that. But a line can surround another line, right? Sorry, that should have been like this. So a line can surround another line, and that's topologically meaningful. So we see that the objects that carry one form charge are lines. So it's, we write the same equation, but now it's not a local operator. It's actually a line which is associated to some curve gamma, and we have the same idea. We take the topological surface, we shrink it around the line, and that must be expandable in the space of lines. So we have some group element that acts on the lines. Okay? It's exactly the same idea. But here we can prove something cute. Previously, we, it was possible that the space of topological surface operators leads to a non abelian group. Because there is no way to commute this surface past this surface. Imagine in two plus one dimension, in three dimensions again, if you have uh, spheres that surround the point, there is, no con there is no way to make the spheres exchange places without something that may introduce contact terms because the spheres will touch each other. But for this, if you have two such lines, if you have two such lines, you can make them act on the line, on the, fun on the, on the they you can make them act on this uh, actual operator line in a different order and it doesn't cost anything because you can shrink them independently without contact terms, without touching each other. So there are contact terms when these topological surface operators touch each other, and these contact terms are interesting. But though in that case, you don't have any contact terms. And therefore, we have proven an interesting theorem, theorem that these symmetries must be abelian. So one-form symmetries, two-form symmetries, and so on must be abelian, while zero-form symmetries may be non-abelian, as we well know from examples. Okay. Now, this is the uh, pass integral interpretation of these objects. In Euclidean, uh, in Minkowski space, you, more li you like to take an operator and act on the Hilbert space. So in terms of the Hilbert space, of course, if we take, uh, a, U if we take a zero form topological surface operator, U of sigma, well, you can, you can ask what objects in the Hilbert space does the zero form symmetry act on? In the, well, it acts on the objects that are created by local operators. Local operators that act on the Hilbert space create particles. So this acts on particles. This is the uh, real time or Lorentzian interpretation of symmetries. What about one form symmetries? Well, uh, one form symmetries will act on the objects in Hilbert space that are created by lines. What are the names of those objects? Strings. Many theories have string excitations, like UCD has a famous flux tube ex well, Young Mills theory has a famous flux tube excitation. Yes? Right. That's independent of the choice. Uh, it's independent of this choice. Just choose some foliation. Um, so you ask what, the, what are these symmetries acting on? So there are par particle excitations, string excitations, two form symmetries will act on sheet excitations. Many theories have a, a dynamical excitations that look like sheets and so on. 
so that's the Hilbert space interpretation of the symmetries. Uh, now, so I'm just introducing uh, terminology, which will be useful. Are there any questions about this framework? No, no, it's actually true in any dimension because if you have co this, in, these are always co dimension two surfaces. And in any dimension, co dimension two surfaces can uh, contract on, on a line independently of each other. So this is uh, true for any one or higher form symmetries uh, that uh, it uh, acts uh, as an abelian uh, element. Yes. The, the, you mean the, the topological surfaces? No, yeah, no. or okay. which ones? I, the two that you said, that it, it's a billion because you can shrink each one separately. But if they, the two yeah, yeah, let me explain. Uh, Michael's question is very good. Let me explain. Um, so we want to compare what happens if we act first with UG and then UG prime, or we do it in the opposite way. So we have some line, which is our, in this notation, W of gamma. And we try to first act with the UG, let's say. So, so we have some. Uh, so we have something like this, where this is UG. I'm drawing in three dimensions. Now you take this UG to be very, very small, and uh, you get some new line. And then you do the same with some. You take. Uh, you do. You do the same with some big uh, UG prime, and you get something. And now you ask, did it matter? in which order I shrunk those two? And the answer is obviously no, because you can shrink the big one first and then the other one. What? However, it could be that this one is linked with that one, but then it's not an action of a simple group element. It's something else. You'll have to study it much more carefully. It does not correspond to the action of a concrete topological surface operator. It's like a new object in the theory that you've defined, which is a linked uh, set of, OK. Another thing that will come very that will become very important soon. Yeah. Well, I mean, for the zero forms, I, I think it's uh, more or less clear. You are uh, you are considering uh, discrete or whatever symmetries of, uh, of this theory as a kind of uh, as a symmetry with respect to some change of variables in, in the path interval. Right. Uh, for the one form, can you uh, can you? I'll give examples soon. All right. I'll actually give many examples with such symmetries. Look, so at this point, my question is: uh, the symmetry which you are associate with one form, can you, I, can you s still think of it as a change of value? Oh yes, definitely. You can even write it on the lattice. You can take models that have <coughs> such a symmetry on the lattice. You can identify the symmetry. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's very similar to what you know. Uh, you'll see examples, but there is one. Okay, yeah. Well, uh, you're talking about that situation? In this situation, since, uh, as I said, the surfaces are topological, you can shrink either one. It doesn't matter which one you shrink first, because uh, these surfaces are topological. So are, as long as they don't intersect anything, they're good. The question that Michael asked is a little bit more sophisticated. I'm not sure that I want to discuss it, but it could be that the space of uh, topological surface operators is in, on, in a non-trivial you see, in three dimensions, there is a in three dimensions there is a, a small fact, which is that the topological surface operators that generate the one-form symmetry are also lines. So they act on lines, but are also lines. So both of these objects are lines in three dimensions. So it might be that the space of operators that generate the one-form symmetry are themselves in a non-trivial representation of the one-form symmetry. So what Michael uh, asked would uh, correspond to computing the representation theory of the space of topological surface operators that generate the symmetry under themselves. And that's like a peculiarity of three dimensions. OK. So another fact which is extremely nice uh, and useful to know, we'll see that the physical interpretation in a second, uh, I mean, in a few minutes, is the following. You might have thought that zero form symmetries 
uh, let's think about three dimensions because it's easier to draw. So let's imagine a topological surface operator, which is like a sphere. So inside this sphere, there is a local operator. And by shrinking that sphere, we'll get the ordinary action of a global symmetry on a local operator. Then we can take another sphere, which is bigger and corresponds to, uh, to some other zero form symmetry. And we could shrink the first one and then the second one, and we'll get this formula. We'll get a product of these symmetries. We could also try to understand what happens if we do it in reverse. We can try to compare u g prime u g with u g u g prime. And this might be non-abelian because when these two, the physical, well, the physical reason that this may not be the same is that there is no continuous way to reverse their, their position in space because there are some contact terms. In fact, I'll show you an example uh, today, very briefly, of a case in which when this, when this sphere intersects this sphere, the contact terms spit out a line. So in addition to just uh, leading to a non-abelian group structure, you also get a, a certain line that's, that sticks out. And this line is a one-form symmetry. So there are some structures which are even more esoteric, which are like higher groups. We'll discuss them soon. Higher groups are those cases in which the algebra of the co-dimension one surfaces doesn't make sense because when you manipulate them, you may also get co-dimension two surfaces that stick out. So then the one zero form symmetries and the one form symmetries are all entangled. And there are interesting physical systems where this happens. So we'll discuss that uh, soon too. Okay. What time? Unfortunately, I'm without a clock. Today. What time is it now? Great. Okay. Okay. Now I want to uh, discuss two additional uh, two additional facts. Yes. Can you have what? Yes. Yes. We'll discuss that soon. You're jumping ahead. Uh, fact number one is the question of symmetry breaking. So one thing that we know and love about the ordinary zero form symmetries is that uh, they can be either spontaneously broken or unbroken in the vacuum, right? Now, if there is a spontaneous breaking of a zero form symmetry, that means that there is some local operator that has a vacuum expectation value, which carries charge under that symmetry. So symmetry breaking means that there is a local operator where the expectation value is non-vanishing and it's an, uh, it carries some charge under, it, under the symmetry. So this is like an order parameter. And the symmetry may also be unbroken. Now, the same thing uh, is true for higher form symmetries. So let's say for one form symmetries. OK, oh, here I wanted to say two more things. So that could be true. And then there are two situations. One is when it's a discrete symmetry. And one, it's, one it co it's a continuous symmetry. In the continuous symmetry case, what happens if you have a non-zero expectation value? You have a massless boson, right? Which is called the number Goldstone boson. So you have a massless scalar field, <coughs> pseudo scalar field. And this, must, this can only happen in dimensions which are bigger than two. It cannot happen in two dimensions. This can happen in two dimensions. And what are the consequences if this happens? You have a, non you have a degenerate vacuum. You have a more than one super selection sector. So more than one vacuum. More than one vacuum. So you have a few ground states. Different super selection sectors. And this can happen in any dimension above one. So let's uh, repeat this discussion for one form symmetries. For one form symmetries, uh, they can similarly be broken uh, by an expectation value. But now we need an expectation value of something that's charged under one form symmetry. So a local operator wouldn't suffice. 
we need an expectation value for a Wilson line. Okay? So the idea is to imagine a big, big Wilson line and uh, support it on some closed curve gamma. And if it has an expectation value, then we say that the one form symmetry is broken. So this means that the one form symmetry is broken. And now there are uh, three different situations to discuss. Uh, when it's unbroken, when it's broken and continuous, broken and continuous, And when it's broken and discrete. Okay? Those are the three logical options. So what happens if a one-form symmetry is unbroken? It means that Wilson lines or line operators with a big, big uh, area surface have zero expectation values, uh, value. This is called confinement. So the objects that are described by this... Uh, the objects that live on this line are confined. So this is called confinement. It's just a very general definition of what we mean by confinement. Confinement happens in theories which have a one-form symmetry, and the one-form symmetry is unbroken. It's just the definition of what we mean by confinement, a rigorous mathematical definition. Isn't, isn't that where you go to area law versus perimeter law for the Wilson? Yes. So yeah, so when I said that, when I said not, sorry? So I since I took the area to be, uh, yeah, I, I have to want to make it a little bit more precise. So when I said that the expectation value is non-zero, what I meant is that it's uh, non-zero for a very big area, but let's say uh, the perimeter doesn't count. Okay. Yeah, so it could be like, uh, non-zero means that it's exponential. Of if, if you get something that's exponential of minus the perimeter, uh, that for me counts a spontaneous breaking of a, uh, a spontaneous breaking of uh, one-form symmetry. Uh, it's a good clarification. So exponential of minus the area means that it vanishes. Exponential of minus the perimeter uh, means that it's uh, spontaneously broken. Yeah. Does strong interactions have a one-form symmetry? Yes. We'll discuss that. Yeah, that's one of the main points, that uh, this whole formalism is useful because it allows for a better and more streamlined discussion of the strong interactions. And in fact, it will lead to new results about yang mills theory. You'll see. So this is what we'll call confinement, when the uh, expectation value is an exponential of the area. Now, if it's broken and continuous, broken and continuous, uh, does anybody know what happens then? Or anybody has a guess? What is the analog of the number Goldstone boson? Of the, here, this is a pseudo-scalar. Exactly. So when it's continuous and broken, this is a mass. This is a Coulomb phase. That's the general definition of what is a Coulomb phase. It's a massless photon. So that. Calling it broken. What? It's like semantics calling it broken. No. The Coulomb phase. The Coulomb phase is the analog of the number Goldstone phase. So. It, the fact that I wrote broken doesn't make it worse. Just terminology. So this gives so the spin one particle in some sense is the number Goldstone boson for a spontaneously broken one form symmetry. Okay. So this is the generalization of the number Goldstone story, and um, when can this happen? So that was only allowed for d bigger than two. What about this? This is only allowed for d bigger than three. Okay. One for symmetry is a gauge symmetry, and vice versa. No, no, no. It's, I'm talking about only global symmetries in this whole discussion. <coughs> this discussion is everywhere just about global symmetries, unitary operators on the Hilbert space. Are you bothered the fact that this is a photon? No, but confinement, let's say. Uh, this is a Coulomb phase. It's a U1 phase. Coulomb, I mean U1. Maxwell. Coulomb, Maxwell. There is the reason that it does not apply in three dimensions is because exactly of what you said. In three dimensions, Coulomb phase can confine. It's in the same sense that in two dimensions, a number Goldstone boson can lead to a smeared wave function. 
like in the C equals one model. It's exactly parallel. Okay. Uh, is this okay? You're just worried about the fact that there is a. When you start to to, to tell to tell me uh, what are the, the symmetry transformations, I will come back to this. Okay. Uh, I can maybe make a small note here for you. Uh, so when you have a Coulomb phase, let's say in four dimensions, there is a conserved symmetry from which you can work out by canonical commutation relations everything you want. G mu nu equals F mu nu. If you have a free photon. So you can just put it in the exponent and work out the commutation relations. And this is the one form symmetry that's spontaneously broken. Okay. In fact, there are two of them, but I'll discuss it. There is also the one with the epsilon tensor. Okay, now we have to discuss. So yes. That's right, but I'm just saying that. Um, yes, there will be in fact a similar issue here. You can uh, ask your question. So the question is whether there is some issue with compactness, non-compactness. There will be a similar issue here. Because as you know, if you have a non-compact scalar in two dimensions, it's almost like a Goldstone boson. It has a, like a very funny, it has a continuous spectrum. So it will be a similar subtlety. But in this, in this set of lectures, I'm assuming that all the symmetries are uh, compact because we don't like non-compact symmetries because they don't have finite dimensional unitary representations. Which is generated by this yes. is part of a gauge group. No, this is a local operator which is completely gauge invariant. This is not part of the gauge group. It's a gauge invariant local operator, and its commutation relations are not in the gauge group. In fact, you can take a circular Wilson line, and this has a non zero commutation relation with it, while the gauge symmetry does not act on circular closed Wilson lines. You see, since it's a local gauge invariant operator, its commutation relations must not be in the gauge group, by definition. <coughs> Any other questions? I'm talking about continuous here. Now we'll discuss broken and discrete. That's what you just said. Broken and discrete. What, is, what does it mean to have some broken and discrete gauge, uh, broken and discrete one form symmetry? It means that you have some Wilson lines with perimeter law. Um, it does not lead to a Coulomb phase. It does not lead to a massless U1 gauge field. Um, and well, it's hard to say generally uh, something intelligent about it, except that this must happen only above two dimensions. And in particular, as you just remarked, it can happen in three dimensions. There are many examples of broken discrete one form symmetries in three dimensions. Many of these deconfined critical points have this have these properties. Have this property. I'll discuss soon. Okay? So these are some general facts. And of course you can repeat this discussion for two form symmetries, three form symmetries, and you just raise the corresponding critical dimensions by one every time. Who got lost? He was supposed to come here? <laughs> no, sorry, <laughs> stupid joke. <laughs> what are you asking? Can you phrase the question more constructively? What about the Higgs mechanism? The Higgs mechanism, what about it? Well, it's not on this list. You, can have you have confinement, you have Coulomb. Okay, in the Higgs mechanism, the monopoles are confined. Yes. Yeah. And but that means that there is an unbroken, <coughs> unbroken one form symmetry. Okay, so for your confinement, is also the truth flute? I didn't say what is the origin. This is a completely abstract discussion. In some examples, the one form symmetry will be associated to an action on the Tooft loops. In some other examples, it will be associated to an action on Wilson loops. So the Higgs mechanism is an example of a unbroken one form symmetry that is associated to an action on Tooft loops. We will see. Yes, yes. We'll discuss it in, in extreme. Three cases that were yeah, I know, I know. So instead of talking in this limit, we have always introduced this. 
Yeah, we'll talk about it soon. I'll talk about specific examples uh, more than you want to know. I just want to introduce uh, the general terminology first. I hope this is a general ter this is general and this is very clear. For example, the U1 Coulomb phase here could be magnetic, could be electric, it doesn't matter. All I'm saying is that there is a massless photon. You don't know where it comes from yet. There will be examples of various sorts <coughs> later on. Okay. Next. The next uh, part of Are there any more questions? Yep. bunch of U1s. Uh, like here, if you have many, many broken symmetries, there could be a bunch of Goldstone bosons. Similarly here, if there are many broken one-form symmetries, there could be a bunch of photons. So yep. when, when you say that you act on a Hope loop or a Wilson loop, a, it's, uh, you have symmetries that act on one and are trivial on the other, <coughs> you don't have things that act interestingly on both. Well, you're asking a very specific question about uh, young mills theory. Yeah. And uh, well, I can, I, the answer is that in young mills theory, pure young mills theory, I'll discuss exactly which symmetries exist. And the answer is that there are objects that act separately. Okay. Uh, but OK, the next topic is the coupling to background fields. Uh, this is coupling to background fields and anomalies. Well, uh, let's talk. Let's call them sources. Coupling to sources and anomalies. So I want to give you a general definition, a completely general definition of what is an anomaly, and this definition is uh, general enough to encompass one-form symmetries, zero-form symmetries, space-time symmetries. It's a very general definition that's uh, useful to know. So when we have a p-form, let's, let's think about the continuous case. In, we'll discuss the discrete case maybe in a few sentences. In the continuous case, we, if we have a p plus one, if we have a p-form symmetry, then we have a p plus one current, right? So we can couple it to a gauge field A with a star, which will be p plus one. So p-form symmetries can be coupled to gauge fields, which are p plus one gauge fields, p plus one uh, form gauge fields. So these are p plus one form gauge fields. Okay. The conservation of the current, the conservation equation, implies that this coupling is invariant under gauge transformations for the source. A, capital A, would always be a background, a source field. It's not going to be pass integrated over. A is always a given source that you're allowed to choose to be whatever you want. So gauge transformation, a gauge transformations in the general case act in the following fashion. OK. And once we couple all our zero form symmetries, one form symmetries, we couple all the symmetries to sources, to such uh, background fields, we then are allowed to study the partition function of the theory as a function of all those sources. This is analogous to what Sasha was studying uh, when he studied the free energy of the system as a function of the source mu. You can think about this mu that Sasha introduced as a source, and he studied the free energy as a function of the source. Similarly, we can study the free energy as a function of all the gauge fields in the system. So it's some well-defined function of all the sources. We believe that quantum field theory uh, computes this function almost unambiguously. OK, now, yep. I didn't quite understand the question. No, I mean, uh, this is also invariant under, uh, uh, so this omega p also has a gauge symmetry, uh, which is p minus so one form and so on. Oh, you're asking mathematically what does it mean? Well, mathematically, a p plus 1 looks like a p plus 1 form, yeah. like in the, what you read about in differential geometry books. But it's not. Because forms, when you glue forms across two patches, when you have two patches and you glue forms, 
the way forms transforms, transform is just by change of variables. They transform like tensors. This is not a form. It may trans when you glue two patches, it may transform by such a transformation. So this is called a P plus one connection rather than a P plus one form. Now omega P is also not a form. Omega P is a P connection because omega P could be a compact scalar, let's say if P is equal to zero. And so it's also not, sing not, not, not a function, it's a, it's a connection. So this is called the Delin, I think, a Delin Mumford chain or something, I forgot. It's like a chain of connections. But these are just gate transformations. You know how to deal with that even without the mathematical definition. If you're so general, you don't want to change also the world volume? Hmm? Uh, world volume? You don't want to check dependence? On the metric? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you could do, 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 do it for instance, yeah. You could try to understand how diffeomorphisms act on your free energy. Yeah. Yes? I, I'm sorry. I mean, it's a, uh, I probably will kind of uh, abstract a little bit uh, the flow of your thought, but uh, I mean, you, when you, uh, as I say, before you go, go forward, uh, uh, away, uh, and back again, uh, you associate the, the, this thing to, to some co-dimension, something to surfaces, right? Yes. Uh, no and you, you never consider, mm, uh, <coughs> up to now you didn't consider boundaries. Oh, yeah, yeah. This well, is a whole separate I know, subject. I know that in, in the zero form symmetry, considering boundary adds a lot of structure. Yes, definitely. Also, are the boundary. Are you going to do that? No. Also, the boundaries of these topological surfaces are extremely interesting object, objects. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, we could discuss them, but I don't have time. Okay. But you can formulate the axioms for what happens when this boundary is. It's a very interesting. For example, in the Ising model, as you very well know, uh, there is a non-local operator which is called the disorder operator. It's a that's line operator. That's why you're asking. And its endpoint is the mu, famous mu field. So that's one interesting case where the boundary condition is a fermion. That's why, I'm asking. That's why you're asking. So yeah. <laughs> so there is a generalization of that story to any dimension, even in Young Mills theory. There are such boundaries and they're interesting objects. Except for free fermions, I'm afraid. They're not free fermions. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, yeah, it's a very good question, and indeed, uh, it's uh, largely this whole story is motivated by the Ising model, of course, which has such a structure. Okay, so uh, there is a, not a general question about quantum field theory, which whether it's, it allows you to compute this free energy unambiguously. But for a moment, let me not discuss it. I'll get back to it in a second. So the condition of gauge invariance implies that f of a p plus one plus d omega p is equal to f p, sorry, ah, p plus one. That's what gauge invariance entails. Can yep. You just, can you just remind me, f, is f is the free energy. f is minus the logarithm of the partition function. OK? Uh, so the condition of gauge invariance implies that the free energy has to be uh, invariant, invariant under gauge transformations. Um, of, of such form. Now, an important fact about the uh, quantum field theory is that this is not always true. So there are many examples. I'll remind you of some examples that are in the books where this is just not true. You try to compute the free energy, using the pass integral, and you find that this does not hold. Now, one has to be a little bit careful to jump into conclusions because the free energy is also not entirely fixed by quantum field theory. So when we say that this is not always true, it's an ambiguous statement because if this is not completely fixed, what do I mean by this is not being entirely true? So now I want to make it a little bit more rigorous. I want to make this statement a little bit more rigorous now. So, so we need to understand whether the free energy is computable in quantum field theory. And the point is that the free energy is computable up to something, up to local terms, up to local terms. What does it mean? That you two, two students could have computed the free energy of a given system, but they may disagree. 
However, there is disagreement uh, must be given by an integral of a local Lagrangian, which is a function of AP plus 1, ta -ta 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 -ta, integrated over the dx. This is, the, this, is the, this is an axiom of quantum field theory, that the only, only uh, non-computable stuff in quantum field theory, in renormalizable quantum field theory, is counter terms. So you can think about it as a counter term. So if two people compute the free energy, uh, they may disagree, but their disagreement is not going to be by an arbitrary function of the sources, only by an integral of a local function of the sources. Now, as you understand, a lot of this discussion is interesting for discrete, okay, discrete symmetries. So some of the sources may correspond to discrete connections or discrete gauge fields. And what, do I, what does it mean to write a local Lagrangian for a discrete object? So here there is some mathematical formalism, but intuitively it's what you think. It's something that's made out of wedge products and derivatives and stuff like that. So one has to make precise what one means by a local Lagrangian for discrete gauge fields, but when you see it, you know it. Okay, local is defined by, for physicists, local is defined by you know it when you see it. Okay? That's what local means. When, you have, when you're dealing with discrete objects, it may not <coughs> appear that something is local or not. It may be confusing, but in most cases, you can see it with a naked, you can sort of judge. Mathematicians have defined exactly what it means to be local, and it's known that their definition is good. I mean, their definition is exactly what you need for quantum field theory. So there is a mathematical definition for what is local. If you want to read about it, the key word is invertible theory. So mathematicians call local Lagrangians invertible theories. We don't think about it as a theory, it's just a counter term, but mathematicians think about it as a theory and they call it an invertible theory. So that's the mat there is a mathematical formalism that tells you what's local, what's not. So first you have to sort of uh, uh, make sure that you know what you're doing, that this free energy is not completely unique. So when you see that the free energy is not gauge invariant, you have, you have to try to fix it first. You may try to add something that's local and render it gauge invariant, but sometimes it's impossible. So when we say that the symmetry is anomalous, when there is no way to fix it. So we say that the symmetry is anomalous when uh, there is no way to add local Lagrangians uh, L local to, L, to, to the free energy such that the free energy is gauge invariant. That's the fully general definition uh, of a Hooft anomaly. It doesn't mean that the symmetry doesn't exist. Uh, by anomalous, I mean a Hooft anomaly. It's just a, you know, yeah, yeah, it's just like a sort of um, extrapolation of what he did. Yeah, it's a... No, 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 no. This case does not mean that the... Sim so, you see the divide... So, this doesn't have... This is not always true, but F of the gauge transform gauge field minus the F without the transformed gauge field Is, a local, is an integral of some local Lagrangian. Okay? So an anomaly, this is a, so an anomaly, a Tooft anomaly, is not a situation where symmetry disappears. The symmetry still exists, but it has a Tooft anomaly. The situation, this situation happens when the difference between this free energy and this free energy is given by the integral over something local, but this integral over something local cannot be eliminated by adding to F something local. Right? By adding to F something local, it's not guaranteed you, that you'd be able to make this go away. Because here you make a gauge transformation, and here you do not. It's a problem in cohomology. Okay? Is this clear? Okay. So this situation where this, there is an interesting a Tooft anomaly is very constraining. And what I'd like to do now is uh, jump ahead 
to an extremely interesting example in quantum mechanics that will make all of this uh, abstract discussion be very concrete. The free, en the free energy is computed by a pass integral of a local Lagrangian. And you get an extremely horrible complicated function. Okay. The function, the free energy, uh, as Sasha emphasized, it has singular pieces, non-local pieces. Because you might be integrating out something that's uh, massless. Are you integrating out things in, in, in the You it pass integrate over everything. Oh, okay. So you get a function of the sources. And if you've pass integrated over something that has uh, long wavelength modes, this function will typically be very be singular. Now, you may disagree with your uh, colleague about this function, but your disagreement is limited to a local function. But if your function is not gauge invariant, it may be that you won't be able to get rid of it by changing your function by a local function. <coughs> so it's a cohomology problem. It's a question of when is L twiddle given by a variation of something local. Not every local. Uh, Lagrangian here is given by a va gauge variation of another local Lagrangian. Okay. So now, how much more? Okay. So uh, now I'm just going to list the consequences of anomalies and then start discussing a very interesting example uh, where you can use that to get some my, to, to to obtain interesting results uh, about an interest about the toy model. So in general, what are, why, why are these Tooft anomalies good for? So our example is going to demonstrate that. But why Tooft anomalies are good for? Well, if they are discrete, we can start from the continuous case. If you have a continuous at Tooft anomaly, what do I mean by a continuous at Tooft anomaly? What I mean by a continuous at Tooft anomaly is that you do a gauge transformation. You compare it to the free energy without the gauge transformation, and you get something that's non-zero, even for infinitesimal gauge transformations. So this group has to be continuous, like U1, and you do a gauge transformation, which is small, and you get something that's non-zero. That's when we have a continuous at Hooft anomaly. If we have a continuous at Hooft anomaly, we must have massless, massless fields, or gapless, gapless, uh, gapless theory. So there must be some massless fields in the theory. If we have a, dis a discrete at Hooft anomaly, what is a discrete at Hooft anomaly? A discrete at Hooft anomaly is that for most gauge transformations, it's zero. Only for gauge transformations that are non-trivial, like large gauge transformations that wind around some circle, or gauge transformations that have an interesting topology, that you get a non-zero result. Or if the gauge group is discrete from the get-go, then, of course, all the gauge transformations are going to be discrete. And so if your uh, anomaly is discrete, it, may it means that the, that the ground state is either degenerate. It, means that it might mean that the ground state is degenerate. Or it could mean that there is a topological field theory. We'll see examples of this later. Topological field theory. Or it may mean that it's gapless. You have many options. For discrete anomalies, it might be that some symmetry which is discrete is spontaneously broken. So this could be due to the spontaneous breaking of some discrete symmetry. Or it could be that you have a non-trivial topological field theory. Or it could be that your model is gapless indeed. So there are several options in, a, in this case. OK, so now let's start doing something uh, concrete. Are there any questions about the general framework? OK, so let's start doing something discrete. How, how can I derive the local uh, curvature for discrete symmetry? Because I don't have a curve, right? That's right. So you're asking, uh, suppose that these gauge fields AP are discrete gauge fields. What does it mean to write a counter term? Right? That's what you're asking. OK, so this is the same question as asking, what does it mean to write local Lagrangians for discrete forms, for discrete gauge fields? So uh, I can give you a stupid example. Let's say you can have a gauge field which is a Z2, Z2 gauge field, and another Z gauge field which is a Z2 gauge field. You could write this in two dimensions. That's lo a local Lagrangian. 
for our Z2 gauge fields. But in general, there is a whole mathematical formalism that tells you how to write local Lagrangians for discrete connections. We won't need most of it here. But if you read about invertible field theories, you'll see this uh, spelled out in full detail. L discrete connections can be defined mathematically, and local Lagrangians can be defined mathematically. This is just an example. In your framework, the U1 global anomaly, where does it appear? What is that one? The U1 anomaly. Oh, the Let's say one flavor. Data prime? No, that, that is not a symmetry, so we, I didn't even discuss that case. I am discussing symmetries of the theory, which act on particles, uh, lines, uh, sheets. They act on the Hilbert space, and they take, uh, you know, they don't change the energy. They commute with the Hamiltonian. The, the U1 story is just a confusion. There is no symmetry, and that's it. So we don't discuss that. I'm discussing actual symmetries, not the uh, symmetries that were thought to be symmetries, but then were found not to be symmetries. And you cannot couple it to background fields. It makes no sense. Yeah. OK, so now a toy model. So this is a, this model, I'm not presenting it just for the sake of it. I'm going to start discussing this model and we'll finish it probably in the next session. But uh, this toy model, I'm presenting it for two reasons. One is that the toy model displays some properties that are similar to interesting two plus one and three plus one dimensional quantum field theories. And the, and the other thing is that this toy model displays the simplest possible uh, discrete anomaly that you can ever hope to see. And finally, the model has interesting non-perturbative physics and some connection with the resurgence. So this is a toy model in quantum mechanics. So uh, let me define the problem. And let me just tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to construct a model in quantum mechanics with two minima. Uh, so there will be some classical system with two minima, uh, very much like the case you know, like x squared plus x to the 4 minus x squared plus x to the 4. But as you know from your graduate school studies, while classically there are two ground states, quantum mechanically, how many ground states does this system have? One. So now I'm going to construct a system which has the exact same property, two ground states classically. But quantum mechanically, there will be an exact degeneracy, even though it's an interacting system. So we'll construct such an example. I'll construct for you such an example where the degeneracy is there non-perturbatively. So the degeneracy remains. You were perhaps told in classes on quantum mechanics that the degeneracy in quantum mechanics is always lifted. That's not true. So I'll show you an example where it's not true. In fact, generically, it's not lifted. It's just an accident that in this example, it's lifted. <coughs> so let me now construct the example. So we're going to discuss a particle in a circle. <coughs> so we have a circle uh, parameterized by a coordinate q. And this coordinate is compact. Uh, it just, it's just a coordinate uh, on a circle of radius 1. So q is some coordinate. And suppose you want to write a Lagrangian for a classical particle moving on the circle. So the classical Lagrangian is going to be q dot squared over 2. Uh, minus the potential on this circle. We might want to put the potential on this circle. Okay, And of course, classically, there isn't anything to discuss here. Uh, everything is known. In particular, if the potential is zero, uh, you have uh, particles moving around with some constant uh, angular frequency. And the energy is given by omega squared over 2. So that's the classical solution of this problem. And there isn't uh, anything else to discuss. Now, quantum mechanically, quantum mechanically, the theory has a parameter that does not exist classically. Uh, that's one interesting thing about this model. Classically, uh, these are all the parameters of the theory, the potential and the kinetic energy. But quantum mechanically, there is a new parameter. Because the wave function does not have to be periodic. The wave function can be periodic up to a phase. 
So the quantum theory has a new parameter, which is physical, which does not exist in the classical counterpart of this story. And this parameter is theta. It's an angle. It's a new parameter that's physical, but classically unobservable. Instead of talking about wave functions which are not single valued, which one finds inconvenient in calculations, you can just think about wave functions that are single valued and just modify the Lagrangian. So you can, in fact, just modify the Lagrangian to account for this theta. theta. Uh, so the Lagrangian that's, uh, we're, that we're going to discuss is this. So classically, this piece that I've added, q dot, makes no difference because it's a total derivative and it doesn't affect the other Lagrange equations. So that's why classically this parameter doesn't exist. But in the full quantum theory, if you think about it as in terms of the Feynman sum over, over histories, uh, any propagation from every point on the circle to every other point, the history of that propagation could have been quite complicated. It would have gone around the circle a few times, and that would have picked, then you would pick a phase. So if you go around the circle n times, this extra contribution would lead to a phase like this. So that's why it makes a difference in the quantum theory, because your history is going to be complicated. You have to sum over all the histories, and that leads to some interference among different histories. So now the main claim. So now let me just make the main claim, and then I'll show you how to prove it using, uh, using this topology. Uh, using uh, the symmetries and anomalies and discrete properties of discrete uh, objects. So let me just formula formulate the precise claim. So the precise claim is that if you take theta to be pi, that will turn out to be a distinguished choice. Uh, theta equals pi just mean, means that if you go around the circle an odd number of times, you get a minus sign. And if you go around the circle a positive number, of, an even number of times, you get a plus rather than a minus. So we make this assumption. And then we take the potential to be cosine of 2q uh, with some coefficient lambda. So this is the potential. OK, so what does it mean? So classically, this is like a ring. So how many minima does the cosine have? Uh, two, right? So there is some uh, minimum at, let's say, uh, pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. So we have two classical minima, and the potential elsewhere is like larger. So we have large potential here and two minima. So classically, this system has two ground states. But I claim that for any lambda, finite lambda, any finite lambda, uh, there the, are the exactly two to degenerate ground states. To degenerate ground states. For any lambda. Okay, so this is the uh, two q. If you just put cosine q, there would be just one ground state, even classically, and there is of course no hope that the quantum theory will have more than one ground state. But with cosine 2q, you have classically two ground states. And, but the claim is that all the instantons exactly cancel, which is very hard to show ex with instanton calculus. But I'm going to introduce some new techniques from topology that allow you to prove this fact. Are there any questions about the claim? Uh, like whatever. Now I'm just giving you an example. V of q being cosine 2q. No, I'm just saying, sure, I mean, of course, uh, if you take some V of Q, which is uh, complicated, there will be uh, some complicated classical solutions. But it's easy to find the ground states. The ground states correspond to critical points of the potential with a positive second derivative. That's straightforward to find. But in the quantum theory, the ground states are much more complicated to find because of uh, tunneling. So my claim is that for theta equals pi and for this potential, you get this. But for theta equals zero, it's not the case. For theta equals zero, you just get one ground state. If you have no potential, then it's doubly degenerate. Yeah, of course. In particular, at lambda equals equal zero, <laughs> we'll take lambda equals zero first. We'll quantize the system at lambda equals zero first. We'll see that this is true. Is it n plus one half 
yeah, we'll see that it's true at lambda equals zero, but then you have to come up with a topological argument to explain why when adding interactions, they cannot split. So in the past, in supersymmetric theories, people have found ways to make sure that ground states don't pair up, like in the Witten index. But here, I'm, you'll see that you can do it without supersymmetry. Okay? So I'll show you how it can be done without supersymmetry. Uh, such, uh, such things um, can be shown without supersymmetry. Okay, so I have 10 minutes left or so. 15. Okay. So let's start. So this is the claim. And as Igor suggested, we're going to start by studying the system when the potential uh, vanishes, just as a review. Then the system is quadratic, and I assume that some of you have solved this exercise in grad school. Uh, but I'm going to review it nonetheless. So uh, for this, uh, if the potential vanishes, we can write down all the wave functions. Uh, uh, it's straightforward. So the Hamiltonian is given by the conjugate momentum. Uh, it's homework to just do the algebra. This is completely straightforward. So this is the Hamiltonian in the case that there is no potential, where pi q is the conjugate momentum, which we represent on the Hilbert space by minus i of d over dq. Okay? This is the, the usual stuff. So remember that our wave functions are now periodic because they, I've eliminated this uh, phase uh, by putting it here. So we can write the wave functions right away. Uh, the wave functions are obviously given by uh, periodic exponentials. So the nth wave function is given by e to the iq n, and n is an arbitrary integer. And I'm going to call this state n. This is going to be my uh, notation for this state. Now the energy of this state is obtained by just plugging it into this formula. And one finds a half n minus theta over 2 pi squared. So now we can draw the energies to see what Igor suggested. So let's try to draw a picture. So let's say that this is the theta equals, uh, well, yeah. Okay. So let's say that this is 0, this is 2 pi, this is minus 2 pi, and this is theta. This is the theta axis. And let's draw the ground state. So what is the ground state at theta equals 0? Which state minimizes the energy? Of course, n equals to 0. That's the smallest possible thing. And the energy of that state grows a like a parabola when you go away from 0. But when you get to 2 pi, uh, the state zero, the cat, this is the cat zero, okay? This is the curve for the cat zero. But the cat, the, 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 the picture for the cat uh, one uh, is a, something that starts off as a parabola around theta equals 2 pi. So uh, we have a similar picture, perhaps uh, like this. And this is the cat one. And similarly, we have a similar picture here for the for for, for the cat uh, minus one for brow or cat I forgot minus one. <coughs> okay, is this clear? I'm just drawing the energies as a function of data for different states. So one thing that's uh, easy to see is that uh, theta is indeed two pi periodic. It may, if you follow a concrete state, like this, the cat zero, then the spectrum does not seem like it's 2 pi periodic because the energy of this guy here and this guy here is not the same. But the full spectrum is exactly the same. So the co co correct mathematical statement that I'm leaving you for an as an exercise is that it is true that theta is 2 pi periodic. It's just that you need to implement a certain reshuffling of states. What is this reshuffling called mathematically? It's called the similarity transformation. So theta equals zero. Well, theta 
and theta plus 2 pi are related by a similarity transformation. Similarity tra by similarity transformation. Similarity transformation just means uh, that we are reshuffling the states. So the mapping is non obvious by similarity transformation. And you have to find the operator that implements that uh, transformation. So you have to find the unitary matrix U such that U H U dagger uh, is the same as H theta plus 2 pi. If such a unitary operator exists, it guarantees that the Hilbert space and the physics are the same, that everything is mapped by some similarity transformation. And I want you to show the claim that this is the similarity operator. So I found it for you, and this is the answer. But please check that with this operator, you get this. So that shows that the physics of, the, the physics of theta is indeed 2 pi periodic. I'll bite in a non-trivial fashion, because you have to do a similarity transformation. In any case, the interesting thing is that there is this point here, pi, where you see that the ground state is twofold degenerate. There are two states which are exactly degenerate, 0 and 1. And similarly, at minus pi, uh, the ground state is twofold degenerate. And this is true in the classical, uh, in the free system. The question is whether this remains true when we add interactions. Well, it does not remain true if we add arbitrary interactions. But if we add this cosine to q, then it does remain true, as you'll see. again no but the ground state is unique yeah I'm talking about the situation where the ground state is too fall degenerate the fact that some excited states fall into degenerate rep uh, uh, into repre non-trivial representations is not interesting we've you, this is true in Lando for Lando levels this is true for even just a harmonic oscillator into two-dimensional space or even in hydrogen atom there is a huge degeneracy for excited states so that's not unique. The thing that's really striking is that the ground state could be degenerate. No, but you see that the cat zero and the cat one have exactly the same energy. Yeah. Uh, so the question is whether this phenomenon is spontaneous time translational symmetry breaking. Uh, I don't think so. Why? What? Why do you say that? I don't. I wouldn't call it spontaneous time reversal. I wouldn't call it spontaneous time translational symmetry breaking. <coughs> what people usually call ti spontaneous time translational symmetry breaking is when you have a continuous spectrum without a true ground state. This is not the case here. Yeah. Oh, you're asking why does the intersection at exactly at pi? Yeah. It's because the energy function was uh, n minus theta over 2 pi squared. And why, why do we choose, uh, I mean, as much as we can choose theta? Can you please this why as much as, why can, why this choice of theta equals pi is uh, both the other choices? Together? Oh, you'll see. I'm going to discuss that. So now we have to discuss the zero symmetries. I have a, I'm, I'm going to dis start discussing the symmetries, but we'll finish the analysis next time. So one symmetry that is always there in the full Hilbert space. I'm talking about. Uh, I'm just. I'm talking about the model without any potential now, right? We're talking about the model where the potential vanishes. So one symmetry that always exists, always exists, is SO2. Uh, since we have no potential, the ring is homogeneous, and you can just uh, shift uh, along the ring. And this is going to be implemented in the Hilbert space by some operators V alpha, where alpha is uh, identified up to 2 pi. So these are the operators that implement uh, the transformation in the Hilbert space. These are exactly those topological surface operators. Okay, Just in quantum mechanics, they are uh, uh, functions of time, so they are time independent. So this is the co-dimension one topological surface operator in this example. So this symmetry always exists for any theta. But there is something special about 0 and pi, about theta equals 0 and pi. There is another symmetry. 
And the, the symmetry that exists only for 0 and pi is q going to minus q. And this is uh, going to be generated in the Hilbert space by C, which uh, you might think about as charge conjugation. Let me explain why this is a symmetry at only those two points. It's because in the Lagrangian, we have q dot theta over 2 pi, right? Now, if you take q to minus q, uh, this is not a symmetry for generic theta because it takes theta to minus theta. So you have to ask, when is theta and minus theta the same? So obviously at 0 is the same, but also at pi it's the same, because pi and minus pi are identified by a similarity transformation. So therefore, this is also a symmetric point under charge conjugation. So there are only two choices that are invariant under the symmetry. Is it clear why theta equals 0 and pi are the two only, only two options? Good. Now, these two transformations do not commute. You can even see it classically, because this generates translations, and this generates an inversion. So they don't commute. And in fact, they lead together to the group O2, rather than SO2. So the classical commutation relation that you would expect is that uh, I'm going to write it here, C, V alpha C is the same as V minus alpha. That's what you expect classically from a reflection followed by a rotation followed by another reflection. It's the same as a rotation at the opposite angle. So the question is whether this is true. This is true for these objects as classical symmetry generators. But now we want to realize them on the Hilbert space as topological surface operators. And the question is whether this remains true when these operators are realized on the Hilbert space. And what I'll show you in the next session, which is, I believe, on Wednesday, is that this is not true uh, at the level of the Hilbert space for theta equals pi. We will interpret it as a Tooft anomaly. I'll explain why it's the same as a Tooft anomaly. And we will see that that's enough to guarantee that this is not lifted by interactions, like cosine 2q. So everything will come down from the breakdown of this relation in the quantum theory. Many of you studied about Virasoro symmetry in two dimensions, which has a central extension. In fact, central extensions also exist in quantum mechanics. So what I'll show you is the simplest example of a central extension, of a central charge. So we'll see that, in fact, this symmetry is true classically, but quantum mechanically there is a central charge. And using that central charge, we'll be able to prove that this symmetry, that this uh, degeneracy is not lifted. Okay, so this is also a very nice pedagogical example of what a central charge means in quantum theories. Any final questions? Yes, you, you had the question, yeah. Okay. Okay, so if no further questions, then.